So now I'm going to invite you to grab your Bible or your whatever, your app. And I'm going to be, we're continuing, this is our second week in the book of Job. That wonderful, thrilling, joyful book <laughs> of scripture in the Old Testament. And get ready, we're going to read a whole chapter. And if you enjoyed Psalm 22, wait till you hear this. So Job chapter 23, beginning with verse 1. And this is Job. Just so you know, Job is responding to his friends because they have told him what they think more than once. Hmm. Then Job spoke again. My complaint today is still a bitter one, and I try hard not to groan aloud. If only I knew where to find God, I would go to his court and I would lay out my case. I would present my arguments. Then I would listen to his reply and understand what he says to me. Would he use his great power to argue with me? No. He would give me a fair hearing. Honest people can reason with him, so I would be forever acquitted by my judge. I go east, but he is not there. I go west, but I cannot find him. I do not see him in the north, for he is hidden. I look to the south, but he is concealed. But he knows where I'm going. And when he tests me, I will come out as pure as gold, for I have stayed on God's path. I have followed his ways and not turned aside. I have not departed from his commands, but I have treasured his words more than daily food. But once he has made his decision, who can change his mind? Whatever he wants to do, he does. So he will do to me whatever he has planned. He controls my destiny. No wonder I am so terrified in his presence. When I think of it, terror grips me. God has made me sick at heart. The Almighty has terrified me. Darkness is all around me. Thick, impenetrable darkness is everywhere. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oof. Lord, open our hearts. Open our hearts to hear your Word. Open our hearts to see and hear more than what we to hear more than what we see and Lord, to see what you would have us understand. Amen. One of the things I do quite often is funerals. I get to do a few weddings, but I do a lot of funerals. I don't remember if I told y'all, but in my very first church, in the first eight weeks, I did six funerals. I got good at it. <laughs> But I will tell you this, I really love funerals, as hard as that sounds, because it's a chance to meet with a family at some of the hardest places in their lives. And my sister knows that our dads was done so badly way before I got called into ministry, way before. I said, Lord, if I ever get a chance to do a funeral, I will do it better. Because after it was over, we looked at each other and said, whose funeral was that? <laughs> no one our day. But it's okay. You know, because God knows our hearts. But one of the things I often tell people, when they have, one of the things we want to do, how many of us want to fix it when somebody's not doing well? Don't you? You want you want to you want to say just the right word. You want to say just the right thing if it's if somebody's talking to you. You want to jump in there and make it different. Well, listen. No. When somebody is at a place where they are broken. When somebody is at a place of loss. Your job. Hear me. Your job is to be there. And these words from Job in chapter 21, the very last verse, 
are words that I have said over and over again to people. How can your empty cliches comfort me? You ever been there? Somebody loses somebody they love there in a better place. Those are hard words. My father-in-law died. I was with him. Um, I pushed his wheelchair into emergency. We thought he was just going to go in and get a little tune-up or something. We knew he wasn't doing well. As a matter of fact, I was teasing him about how the top of his head was bald and shiny and I was kind of blinded. <laughs> and he was laughing, chuckling. And then 30 minutes later, he is gone. 30 minutes from a laugh to eternity. And we're there stunned because this wasn't like he had been suffering a long illness that we knew about. He just wasn't getting better. He'd gotten like a cold or something and just wasn't getting better. And what we found out was that unbeknownst to us and unbeknownst to him, he had been suffering a series of silent heart attacks. And there was nothing that could have been done. But I remember as we were standing there in the ER, and we're, we're all just staring at each other at that point of shock, you know, where you really don't know. You just don't know. There was a lady, this week they were escorting us out, one of those small rooms. And she obviously overheard that he had died. He hadn't even made it into one of the rooms yet. You know, he was in one of those places separated by a curtain. And she leaned in the door frame, and she said to me, well, he's in a better place. Y'all have been proud of me. Because <laughs> I looked at her, and I said, my head knows that, but right now, my heart is broken. Mm. And this is the thing, I don't believe that woman meant anything unkind. I don't think she meant to say anything to hurt me. I think she believed that the words that we sh she was offering me were words of faith that would maybe bolster me in this place of where we were broken and hurting. But you know what? I'm sorry. Would have been perfect words. I'm praying for you. Would have been great words. I love you. I'd even taken that from that woman. Because I believe she would have loved me with the love of Christ. And I believe that she truly was loving me in the love of Christ. And the only way that she knew how in that moment. Well, God bless Job. Job is in the middle of a situation that he cannot understand and he cannot fathom. And he has had those well-intended friends. You remember the names? No, I didn't expect you to. <laughs> Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar. Not Zoloft. <laughs> so far. They've come alongside Job. They've done the thing that friends will do. They've come alongside him. And they sat for the longest in the ashes with him. And they listened to Job complain and, and, and be distraught. But what's happened is they've been there long enough, in their opinion, and they've moved from that place of companionship to a position of accusers. What? But think about this. If you've been taught all your life that good things come to people who follow God's law and bad things come to people who move against God's law, then it makes sense, doesn't it? 
Job was rich. Job had sons and daughters and daughter-in-laws. He had animals. He had thousands of everything. He was a wealthy man. And suddenly, it was gone. So he must have done something. Mm -hmm. So his friends came around thinking, okay, you know, we're going to, this is me interpreting. <clears throat> we're going to come around and we're going to surround him and he's going to know that we care. And sooner or later, he's going to confess to us what the thing is that he has done. And then we can pray on his behalf and then we'll move on down the road and everything will be well, right? No. And this is the thing. When we are in places of darkness, when we're in a place of loneliness and hurt, Job did and does the exact same thing that we all do. You might hear ever had something bad happen to him. You don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> a nod would work. Maybe you've had a loss. Maybe it's been an illness. Maybe it's been financial. Maybe it's been a friend. Maybe it's been a spouse or a job. But you you have experienced something significant. And then Job does the exact same thing that we do. Don't we? He demands an answer. He wants an answer for why is he experiencing this wrong done against him. Because you see, he's done all the right things. He demands an answer because he is broken and he is hurt. He demands an answer because he is exhausted from the weeping. And the, the mind that won't stop running. He demands an answer because he needs to understand. He wants to understand what it is. And he demands an answer because somebody needs to be accountable for this. God needs to tell him. Why has this happened? That's pretty bold, isn't it? But I would challenge you, if you've ever gone through a loss, I'm betting you've probably had some of those very same questions. I imagine you felt guilty you were having some of those very same questions. I want to tell you something. This is how God created us. It's when we stay there that it's a problem. I've had some big losses in my life. And there were times when things were running around in my head. I thought, I am losing my mind. And God, I don't get this. This doesn't make sense. Anybody here ever seen Rembrandt's painting, The Prodigal? You seen a picture of it? Do you know what I'm even talking about? We have no idea. <laughs> it's that picture. It's kind of dark. And the son is kneeling in front of his father, right? And the father has his hands on his son's back. It's an amazing painting. I thought it was about this big. It's about twice of that. We saw it when we were in St. Petersburg, Russia. And we stood in front of that painting. And we marveled. And when you look at that painting, one of the things that you don't see in a smaller version is in the back, kind of 
have on the left hand side, there's a figure. There's somebody standing in the back. You can't really make out his face. You can tell it's a person, but you can't tell a lot. Well, Henry Nowen talked about this particular painting in his book, Home Tonight. And this is the background for that painting. He painted that picture. This is what's amazing to me. We stood in front of it, y'all. It was gorgeous. It was huge. It was painted between 1665 and 1667 at the very end of Rembrandt's life. It said that when he was a young painter, he was very popular in Amsterdam, and he would do all kinds of portraits. He was commissioned for those. He was one of the people who the the folks, the important folks, the politicians and the wealthy would call on Rembrandt to do their paintings. He said Rembrandt was pretty arrogant. He was argumentative, but because he and he you know he participated in the high societies of Amsterdam. But however, gradually bit by bit his life began to deteriorate. First he lost a son, then he lost his first daughter, then he lost his second daughter, then he lost his wife, and then the woman that he lived with ended up in a mental hospital, and then he married a second woman who also died. Rembrandt was a man who experienced immense loneliness in his life. That's the man who painted that picture of the prodigal. And it said that as he experienced all these losses and these personal deaths, that he could have become a bitter and angry and resentful person. But instead, he was the one who was able to paint one of the most intimate paintings of all time. The Prodigal. A painting of forgiveness and grace and welcome. And you see, this was not a painting that he was able to do when he was young and arrogant and successful. He moved to another place in his life. It says he was not only able to paint the mercy of a blind father who had lost everything, all of his children, but one, two of his wives, all of his money and his good name and popularity. Only after he was able to paint the mercy of the blind father when he had lost everything was when that painting came about. <coughs> said that he painted that painting from a place of mercy when he came to understand what and who God was about. Somehow, his loss emptied him so that he was able to receive and feel the mercy and the grace and the love of God said that when Vincent Van Gogh saw this painting, he said, you can only paint this when you have died many deaths. Mm. Mm. Said that Rembrandt did it because he had died so many deaths, and yet he knew what God's mercy meant. You know, I appreciate the book of Job. Because in Job, this man expresses all the emotions that each one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, deals with at one time or another. We're angry. We don't understand. We want justice. We want things the way we want it. And Job is not afraid to argue with God and let God know exactly how he feels. Somehow it feels like if we express our rage 
and our anger and our disappointment, if we allow ourselves to rail against God, then we are not good Christians. We don't have enough faith. You ever felt that way? I know, Lord, I shouldn't feel this way, but. Here's the thing. When we are in the midst of crisis, look for God. Yeah. When we can't find him, when we need an audience, when we need to understand, when we need that justice, when we need what we need, and God is gone, he seems to be in hiding. Well, just maybe. Maybe God is there. But maybe what he needs is for us to just exhaust ourselves. That's right. Pour ourselves out so that God can begin to fill us up again. That God can remind us of that hope and that mercy. So that God can bring us into life again. You see, I think God is there in the darkness. Watching. Waiting. Just waiting for us to be quiet. So then he can speak to us. In that whisper. Reminding us who he is and whose we are. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so thankful Lord, remind us that even in the stillness you were there. Turn off our racing minds and our anxious thoughts and bring us into that place of peace and assurance with you. Thank you for what you've done and what you will continue to do in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you're never far. And we thank you for your love and your strength.